In this video, we'll consider the moment of inertia. Now, the moment of inertia is the analog to mass for rotation. Let's consider four particles here. We could do more, but let's consider just four. And they're all rotating in some direction, like this, around some central point right here. And they're rotating together in a rigid. You can think of these as like being spokes on a wheel, although I'm not going to consider them to have any masses. Uh, they could be that they're held by gravitational electric forces later on. So these four particles are rotating around together. They all have the same omega. And somebody asks you the question, how can we calculate the kinetic energy of this four particle system? Well, they each have different speeds at each instance. They have different velocities and that they're going in different directions. They each are different distances from this point. So they're like on different circles. But if you want to calculate the energy, there's no reason with that being a scalar that we can't do it the way we've always done it. And the answer to that thing is just sum up the energy of the individual particles. Use 1 half mv squared for each one of these and solve it. So that's the answer to the question, and that is what's going to lead us to this concept of moment of inertia. So answers. How can you find the t rotational kinetic energy? Just add the kinetic energy of the four particles. So that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do it just for four and then we'll generalize it later on. So the rotational kinetic energy, because this thing is just rotating, has to equal kinetic energy of particle 1, kinetic energy of particle 2, kinetic energy of particle 3, and kinetic energy of particle 4. That means the rotational kinetic energy has to equal 1 half mass 1 times its speed squared, 1 half mass 2 times the speed of particle 2 squared, plus 1 half mass of particle 3, speed of particle 3 squared, oops, sorry, squared, not cubed, and 1 half mass of particle 4, speed of particle 4 squared. Notice the subscripts. The mass and the speeds are different. So this mass doesn't have to be the mass of anybody else, and its speed is not the same as anybody else. So it needs subscripts. The 1 half, however, is the same for all of them. It doesn't need subscripts, so we could factor the 1 half out. Uh, let's pull the one half. So mass one, v one squared, mass two, v two squared, mass three, v three squared, mass four, v four squared. And I'm kind of doing this the longhand way, not taking advantage of any math tricks or anything that one might know to be able to handle sums, but I'm doing that because some of you may not have experience with those sort of things. At this point, I would like to connect in the fact that while all of these have different tangential speeds, they all have the same angular speed because they're rotating together. So I'd like to rewrite these speeds in terms of their angular speed. And I remind you of something, but the tangential speed of the ith particle, where i could be 1, 2, 3, ith particle. Put in whichever number you want, 1, 2, 3, or 4, is equal to the angular speed, omega, times r sub i, where this is the distance to the axis. And this is from the last module that we covered already. What that says is, is that how fast you run depends on the rate at which you're running around the circle, but also the radius of the circle you're running on. So if we go back up and look here, this particle is much further away than that then is this particle from the center. So this guy's running on a small circle. 
So they both run around the circle, say, one time in one minute. But this one has a much greater distance to cover, and so consequently has a greater speed. The ratio is that this is one meter and this is three meters, then this particle has to have a tangential speed three times what this tangential speed is. They have the same omega, but you have to multiply by the radius. That is, from this point to wherever the particle is. So I want to, since they may have different r's to each one of these v's, I want to put in that relation. So I'm going to put in that relation right here. That the rotational speed is one half m1 times omega r1 squared plus m2 omega r2 squared m3 r3 omega doesn't matter the order squared plus m4 omega r4 squared now you might notice the omega doesn't have a subscript that's because they all have the same omega but they don't have the same r's now I need to square that and once I do that I get k rotation is one half I have m1 r1 squared omega squared or I just squared those two I have m2 r2 squared omega squared I have m3 r3 squared omega squared and I have m4 r4 squared omega squared now since they all share the same omega I can factor the omega out of these terms so I'm going to do that one half now you might think I bring the omega out here but I'm going to choose to leave it in the other direction I'll show you why in a minute squared plus m2 r2 squared plus m3 r3 squared plus m4 r4 squared all of that multiplied by omega squared this is the angular speed and this is one half now let's compare compare our results to our translational that means just moving not rotating kinetic energy formula from chapter 6 there we had kinetic energy at translation was one half m v squared and that was the speed and this was inertia or what we called mass so when I look at the rotation compared to this I see the same one half I see speed squared and I have angular speed squared the rotational analog so this thing here whatever it is this has to be like inertia so this quantity whatever this weird thing is it's like rotational inertia so m1 r1 squared m2 r2 squared m3 r3 3 squared plus m4 r4 squared acts like 
a rotational well analog of mass Now, I did that only for four particles, but I could think of doing it with more. Five, six, seven, eight, and each term will get a mass times an r squared. You can write that in short term. This rotational analog is called a moment. The reason it's called a moment is when you take something and multiply by a distance, that's called the first moment in mass. When the, the, the center of mass is related to the first moment. If you do it to the square of the distance, that's called the second moment. So this is the second moment of mass, but we give it a slightly different name. We call it the moment of inertia. And we define it with the symbol i. So i is defined as the sum, where i equals 1 to how many ever particles you have. It could be 5, 10, 10 to the 28th. The mass of the ith particle times the distance to the axis of rotation squared. So that's just m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared. And this is called the moment of inertia. And that's its definition. Now the moment of inertia is the rotational analog of mass, as I've said before. It tells us how difficult it is to change the object's rotation. The bigger I, the more difficult it would be to stop it, just like a boulder is harder to stop than a fly. However, unlike mass, the moment of inertia is not just a property of the body. It depends upon the axis of rotation and how the mass is distributed because it depends on the r's. If the axis of rotation is changed, or the object's shape changes, then the object's moment of inertia will change. That completes this video. In the next video, I'll show you how to calculate some moments of inertia.